Well, welcome, everybody. I was just waiting to make sure everybody could sign on. The numbers are still going up a little bit. Merit Skovich here with Catherine Small. Thank you for joining us for our weekly um, Healy ALS platform trial. Um, because we've we've had some new people joining, we wanted to start this meeting by kind of uh, showing our, our video about the platform trial, just for those uh, people who haven't, uh, haven't been here before. Um, and so maybe we'll go to the next slide for that. Uh, so this is just a brief video about the platform trial. Something new is here in the fight against ALS. The first ever ALS platform trial designed to accelerate the development of effective and breakthrough treatments for people with ALS. So what's different about the Healy ALS platform trial? Instead of testing just one drug, the Healy ALS platform trial can evaluate one or more drugs at the same time and will keep testing new treatments as they are discovered. This means more opportunities to find groundbreaking therapies in a faster time frame. Imagine having to build a new dock every time a different ship came to port with new treatment cargo. This is how traditional trials work. In platform trials, there is one dock to receive all the cargo and connect the treatments to their final destinations. Central infrastructure can be shared among therapies. And because different treatments are tested using a common master protocol, placebo data can be shared. In other words, patients have a far greater chance of receiving active treatment than in traditional trials. The Healy ALS platform trial began with three drugs selected by an expert evaluation committee. While therapy assignment to patients is random, each drug has an equal chance of success based on scientific evidence reviewed by the researchers promising new drugs will be added as soon as they are ready. The trial operates across an expanding network of coordinated sites nationwide. Working as a team, increasing access for patients. More data, faster results, lower chance of placebo, breakthrough progress. ALS doesn't wait, and neither can we. The Healy ALS platform trial is active now. We will continue to test new treatments. We will increase patient access to potentially life-changing therapies. We will drive the development of new biomarkers until we find the cures for all people with ALS. Thank you. Um, so we, we have a few updates and then we'll open it up for questions. Um, so, um, you know, so many of you on this call and really throughout the, the world and the United States have been part of uh, the platform trial. So I really want to thank everyone. We couldn't have gotten this off the ground without um, a lot of input from people living with ALS, our, our patient advisory committee, and um, without all the people that participated in the study. So thank you for that. Uh, next slide, please. So just just a brief update. So um, as mentioned on the video, the mass, the Healy platform trial has a common protocol and the shared infrastructure. We started with the three um, uh, first drugs, what we call uh, we called it each drug a regimen, uh, regimen A, B, and C. We added a fourth one, uh, D, in um, and, um, and then we added a fifth one, E. And then right now we're actively enrolling participants in uh, the sixth and seventh drug regimen F and G. Um, so we have 70 centers throughout the United States that are enrolling participants in the study, and we've uh, enrolled over 1,300 uh, people in the study. Uh, next slide, please. So we, we've shared the results of the first four uh, drugs um, shown here. Of those first four, two um, did not work. That was regimen A and regimen B, um, Zalucoplan, Verdipostat. Um, the third and the fourth had um, some positive data. But it didn't work on everything that we looked at, but it did have some positive data. And those are moving on to phase three testing. So another, uh, uh, these will be global studies. Clean um, is uh, the company that uh, for regimen C. And we showed that that drug um, had a positive effect on longevity, um, as well as uh, key clinical outcomes, such as timing to 
needing to start um, maybe nutrition with the G-tube or BiPAP. Um, Prodopidine by Perlenia had positive results on measures of speech and bulbar function, and also um, on overall function in um, a subset of uh, participants who had a faster disease course. Um, uh, Regimen E is in the data analysis stage right now, and um, we should have results soon. Regimen F and G are actively enrolling uh, participants uh, at uh, all these centers throughout the United States. Uh, next slide, please. So for each of the regimen, um, if people are eligible for the study, there's a three to one randomization to active drug for, or placebo. So 75% of people get active drug, 25% placebo for the 24 week randomized portion. After that 24 weeks, uh, people have the option to continue on active treatment extension until we have the results of the study. The main thing we're looking at is does this slow down the loss of function? We're also looking at measures of strength and breathing and biomarkers uh, to learn as much as we can about the particular treatment. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we share the, the data from the placebo between the regimen. That's how we get the efficiency um, and how we can get to results faster and at lower cost. And it's a, a more patient-centered type of trial. Uh, next uh, click, please. Um, we for this study, it's uh, the entry criteria a little broader than some other uh, clinical trials going on right now in ALS. So uh, people who have the symptoms for three years or less, or whose breathing is, is greater than fifty, are eligible for the study. And standard of care is allowed uh, during the trial, uh, meaning that people can be on rilazole, daravone, and rilivrio if they, they would like to. Next slide, please. We're also trying, you know, we, the primary goal is to see if the drugs work uh, on the illness, uh, but we also want to learn about ALS. Um, so we've incorporated different biomarkers, including looking at genetic um, background, biomarkers like neurofilm and digital apps as well. Uh, next slide. Um, to find a center, um, uh, you can go onto our uh, website or this link here. You could also uh, contact Catherine Small, who's here, um, and she can put her contact in the chat, and she, and um, she can help uh, connect you with the center near you as well. Uh, next slide. Um, so for our active um, trials now, uh, regimen F and G, um, we are looking for 300 people for regimen F and 240 for regimen G. Uh, 516 people have uh, already uh, uh, provided consent for the at the master level. Um, 438 have been assigned to either uh, F or G, and 392 are actively enrolling. We think that we'll be enrolling for the next uh, few months on, on uh, F and G, um, and we'll obviously keep people here informed of, of um, progress. Next slide, please. So, um, Happy New Year to everybody. Uh, so we have um, some updates on, on these webinars. Uh, we we really enjoy seeing everyone here and your great questions. Uh, we are, we'll keep having most of these uh, Thursday webinars about the platform trial, but given um, the number of expanded access protocols that are active now, that are funded through Act for ALS, we're also gonna add uh, on the second Thursday of the month, uh, updates on the expanded access protocols. Next slide. Um, as I mentioned, Catherine is available to help. Um, here's her phone number as well as her email and other ways to, to reach her. And also Alice Bula works closely with us um, to help um, on the strategy around the platform trial and access and information. And they're both, as you know, very, very available um, and knowledgeable. Um, so next uh, week will be a webinar on the um, uh, the expanded access protocols, and we'll have guest speakers from the um, National Institute of Health who are funding those expanded access protocols. Um, the week after, we'll have an update on regimen D, uh, predopidine with the Prolenia Therapeutics. And the week after that, we'll have an update uh, from clean nanomedicine on uh, regimen C. So those are the two uh, I mentioned before going forward to phase three testing. Uh, next slide. And that's it. So um, I think uh, Dr. Paganoni has arrived, and um, I might, if it's okay with her, um, ask her your questions. Thank you so much, and apologies for the for joining a few minutes late. Really great to start the year with all of you. 
and this great overview. And um, with, with Catherine and Alison, we're really planning uh, a great um, series of webinars over the next few weeks. So uh, you've seen the, the schedule and, and we'll continue to add speakers. Uh, we always love to have uh, people come and join us to share more science and more updates with all of you. So please uh, put any questions you might have in the uh, in the Q&A. And I know often uh, Catherine has some questions that, that people have sent in advance. I was going to say we have a lull, so there aren't any questions submitted yet, so get them in. But somebody asked me over email, um, for people who are participating in the trial, say, for example, someone enrolled in Regimen F or Regimen G, the period where they're coming to the close of that 24-week placebo-controlled portion and rolling into active treatment extension, how do you talk to participants who might be thinking you know, about other options if they are eligible for an EAP or if they should go into the active treatment extension? Um, how do you have that conversation? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to give it a try, uh, but uh, obviously, you know, um, my first recommendation is to always talk with your uh, treating physician because there's always specific details about everyone's situation everyone's history or specific condition that might affect uh, the choice. Uh, but in general, the way I present it um, is that, you know, um, the, the, the trial is really one trial to, um, to include both the placebo control phase and the active treatment extension. And it was designed as one trial with these two different components to try to learn as much as possible from the trial about the uh, safety and effectiveness of the drug but also to give people options and sort of the assurance that after volunteering their time for the placebo control person, they could have access to the actual active drug. So my recommendation would be, if, you know, everything else, you know, is okay in one's specific situation and, and medical history is to continue to try uh, the active treatment extension because by doing so, uh, the participant, number one, continues to contribute so generously to research and to our um, knowledge about the drug. And also number two, uh, which is very important for everyone, you know, to, to, to know that they have had the chance to experience the actual drug. So I think it's always a good idea to try to continue uh, unless, again, there are very specific circumstances unique to you uh, that would prevent that. I might add that I really think of it, and the FDA thinks of it as one study. There's a part of it that's double blind, and there's part that's open um, access. But it's so important um, to be able to tell if a drug works to have data from both parts. Um, it, it gives uh, we really try to keep the placebo uh, control part as short as possible. But sometimes drugs take a little longer to to work. We saw that, for example, in the gene therapy. A trial for SOD1 and in Amalix. Um, so it, it's that that open label extension is a really important part of drug development. Um, so I, I'll go through some of the questions, Sabrina, if you're, you're open to answering them. Um, the first one is whether there's any additional information on the, the clean drug, Regimen C, from their recent press release. Um, and is there any information past 76 weeks? You know, that's a, that's a great question. First of all, I, I do want to say that it's important that we continue to learn about each drug. And, and sometimes these complicated statistical analysis take time, number one, because, you know, uh, we follow people longer. Uh, and number two, because we, we continue to, to think about creatively about how to best analyze the data. And so the, the recent uh, analysis that was led by, by the company, um, you know, again, uh, provide additional information about the drug. So uh, there are some um, positive signals. I believe that Osukovic reviewed them uh, during the presentation. Uh, and, and and then, you know, I think that, that that kind of, you know, doesn't go beyond a certain, you know, uh, time frame but uh, add to the information that was presented earlier. Uh, I will say that I, you know, I think that the next step for the drug uh, is to do another study, a phase three trial, uh, because in, in general, in, in, in drug development, we want to do that. We want to learn as much as possible about the drug in phase two and then replicate that in phase three. And that's exactly what we're doing here, to learn as much as possible, really uh, make sure that we don't miss any signal, make sure that we do all the analysis that are needed, which take time sometimes, you know, uh, because of the of, of the large amount of data, uh, and then move on to another trial. So hopefully there will be another trial soon. Thank you. There's a question about wh whether any of the regimens have um, shown slowing of, of uh, progression. Yes, yeah, so in the, in the regimen, um, 
see indeed there were some signs that were uh, positive again I, I think it, 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 you know the, the specifics of that you know we shared in the past and we, we can share again and you they were also summarized earlier but uh, essentially it's uh, the, the positive signals that we're talking about suggest slowing of progression in some of the parameters not all of them so that's you know that's where we need additional trials a phase three trial for both regimens C and D to confirm this and make sure that we we take a, a, another good look and, and take another picture of the effects of the drug. So the positive results that were mentioned on time to event, time to certain uh, procedures or or speech changes in in the in the case of regimen D, those are all consistent with slowing of, of progression. Thank you. Um, so, a question about whether there's any updates on um, uh, for regimen F and G about whether there might be a compassionate use program in the future. Yeah, we've been having those discussions with uh, both companies, and, and I believe actually that they also presented publicly during these webinars about the question that was asked by by some of you, and and uh, just a plug, they will be back, uh, you know, very soon, <laughs> I guess, in the February March timeframe. So, uh, you you still have another, you know, in addition to watching the recordings and their answer, again, I just want you to know it's an ongoing conversation, so we, you will have another opportunity to ask them directly. Uh, so far, uh, because you know, um, we're still. Learning about the drugs, the, the two companies prefer not to start uh, in expanded access at this time. Uh, but again, it's been an ongoing conversation, and I think that the, the questions from the community uh, and, and 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 keeping it on our radar and their radar uh, really helps. Thank you. There's a question that if, if someone is having a screening appointment to join the platform trial in mid February, would that still be okay? The trial won't be full at that point. Yes, I, I would expect that, that there will still be spots uh, because, again, we are we are looking for another, you know, um, for a few people, I think, uh, a little, you know, 100 people or so. And I think, you know, with the return after the holidays and, you know, uh, I think we, we saw a little bit of a slowdown there as we every trial sees and now we're catching up, but I would expect to still have uh, the spots. Um, there's a question about the... Um... EAP for clean, uh, the NIH funded one, and it might be something we can answer um, next next week better. But in case in case you know, maybe it is um, Columbia still scheduled to be a trial site for um, the clean EAP. Um, and, and any information that you have. Yes, you absolutely. Speak. In fact, Columbia is is heavily involved in, in the trial itself because the, the academic PI is Dr. Andrews, who is at Columbia uh, and works closely with CLEAN on this EAP. So absolutely, uh, I believe that Columbia will be part of it. But again, I would uh, encourage you to contact Dr. Andrews uh, there or her staff. Um, and, and and also want to thank you for asking about EAPs. And, and because now there's so many EAPs, I mean, these they just didn't exist even when we started doing Doing this, the EAPs didn't even exist for ALS just you know three or four years ago. So now there's many, and that's why we thought we we're gonna do a, the second week of every month a webinar on EAPs specifically to bring you all the updates. There's a question about if we could maybe explain what the the, the drugs and the rationale for um, regimen F and G, um, and also maybe uh, we can put the link to the, the webinar about those as well. Yes, definitely. I mean, uh, both are targeting uh, sort of a, a hot topic in the field, uh, uh, some some uh, a mechanism that, 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 that has really risen to prominence over the last few years in terms of the being critical in, um, to ALS. And so uh, essentially they both target a mechanism that's about the integrated stress response. So this is a mechanism that um, all the cells have normally to respond to stress. So when there is a stressor that's sort of transient, uh, that's a good thing that you have a response mechanism. But then when there's a chronic stressor, for example, uh, perhaps a genetic mutation or other causes of ALS, this system gets overactive uh, to the point that then um, you know it, it's it's actually uh, harmful, um, and so uh, essentially ultimately what happens is that the, the, there is a toxic buildup of proteins that cannot be cleared as efficiently as they would be under normal conditions or under temporary stress. Because again, the stress is uh, kind of chronic uh, or prominent. Uh, there is this ultimately this dysregulation and uh, you know abnormal buildup of proteins. So we have um, a few, um, again, a few recordings with all the slides and, and, and again, we'll invite them back uh, for further uh, discussion. Thank you. 
Um, there's a question about the uh, regimen D for prodopidine. If we could speak to the the subsets of of participants in that regimen that um, that we looked at um, uh, results in, and if if there's any plans for further development. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, as, as Dr. Sokovic mentioned, you know, this trial is is uh, has some inclusion criteria that uh, it's a little bit broader. So we really wanted to learn as much as possible about uh, the, the largest possible share of the ALS population. However, as we've seen in, in other trials, uh, there seems to be, you know, subsets of people such as those uh, earlier in progression uh, and, and with a faster progression rate. They might just be more sensitive for detecting a drug effect. And I want to explain what that means. You know, if, if somebody has a slower progression, it may take longer to see an effect. If On the other hand, if you look at the subset of people that are all progressing at the same rate um, and maybe rapidly, so perhaps uh, we, we have more statistical power to see an effect in the context of a phase two, six month trial. So this was important for us to sort of use the trial, um, you know, to, to test the drug and to learn as much as possible and also to identify groups of people that might, might be more likely to respond. So I think that the next step would be to um, to do another phase three trial uh, as has been planned uh, and including um, perhaps those those subgroups that um, were more uh, likely to respond as well as other people, uh, either part of the trial or part of the expanded access uh, if they cannot be included in the trial so that we can continue to learn about the drug. Thank you. Um I'm going to, um, there's a lot of questions, which is really good. I'm going to um, ask first the ones that are related to the uh, platform trial. And then if we have time, there's a few that are, are related to other drugs um, that we'll try to get to as well. Um, so there was a question for someone who's newly diagnosed, how long does it take to identify eligibility um, and um, and be able to participate in the study? Yeah, so that, that you know, that should be, um, if, fairly efficient process uh, uh, at the site. Uh, I will say if 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 you're being screened and assessed at the site where you're also receiving clinical care, obviously they already have all the uh, materials about you, you know, they already know all your test results and all your medical notes, and that should be fairly rapid. If you're if you're going to a different site, in other words, if you, if you have to have the uh, medical records transferred, I think that's the first step. Uh, really, it's more about reviewing the records and doing a, an exam. Uh, and, and collecting some uh, safety labs, uh, some measurements to make sure it's safe to take the drug. Uh, and and then, so normally it can be rapid, um, you know, in terms of assessment. Obviously, it's important to to get connected and make sure that uh, the, the appointment is booked and all the records are available. So uh, kind of a related question. There's a participant who's uh, participating in Regimen G. So uh, thank you for that. Um, but they're saying that from the time they kind of screened and uh, for the master platform and they started treatment, it was um, uh, two months or from volunteering to beginning. Um, and they, so that's just a comment. And then the question is, how many simultaneous trials of drugs are you hoping for and have funding and staffing to accommodate? And are you turning down any pharmaceutical companies? Yeah, no, these are all great questions. And I think it speaks to the, the dramatic shift that we have seen in ALS research literally over the last three or four years. So before we had the problem that there weren't as many drugs, there weren't enough drugs. Uh, and, uh, you know, there, there, you know, we couldn't even fill the, the spots for the drugs that we had in trials. Now we sort of have the opposite problem, which is a good problem to have, that we have many drugs and also um, sites are received, there's more interest because of the wonderful engagement from the community, like, you know, obviously shown on this, on this webinar where we have uh, lots of attendees and lots of great questions. And so, because people are getting, you know, uh, more, you know, there's more opportunities really for participation. Uh, now I think that sites are also feeling um, sort of the, the burden of, you know, how to accommodate everyone. So, um, so again, that's why sometimes it may take a few weeks, which is also connected to the previous question. Uh, you know, it, it sometimes it, it's it, the assessment itself is 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 rapid. The problem is that you know you need to get the appointment, and you know if there's a lot of interest, which is a good thing, uh, then the, this could overwhelm sites. So we separately we're working on ways to increase capacity at the sites and trying to find you know working in partnership with many other groups uh, trying to really support the sites because they're doing great work and sometimes they're, they're just understaffed. Uh, so we're hoping to continue to have two or three drugs um, going on, um, you know, uh, at any given time. And so obviously there's a little bit of a cycle, right? You know, we have new regimens, they get enrolled, 
then we need to follow people, all participants for six months or even through the active treatment extension. And then after that, we can sort of reboot with the next set of drugs. Thank you. So question of how do we decide on three years for the inclusion criteria for from symptom onset to um, baseline? Yeah, that's an important question. So there was a lot, and, and when I say a lot, I mean thousands of uh, hours and you know the simulations on the computer. The statisticians have been very busy uh, working on all the statistical models to to figure this out. So essentially, um, the good news is that in in we do have this great database called Proact, which is a collection of um, all clinical trial data from previous uh, clinical trials, and so. Uh, because of that, the statisticians were able to train models to figure out, you know, sort of the uh, the, the optimal um, eligibility criteria to have statistical power to see an effect because of the variability among patients. You know, as you know, uh, no no two people are the same, right? And, and so, especially in ALS, people can really have very different experiences. And so, it's important to really uh, make sure that we design criteria so that we can see a treatment effect if there is one. And that's kind of the, the, the reason for the cutoffs. And, and it's all statistically driven to make sure that we can see, we have the numbers to, to, to show an effect. Um, there's a question of whether, this was a quick question, but do we have any efficacy results for regimen G? N not yet from this trial, because we can only see the results at the very end. Uh, both F and G had some uh, phase one trial results that were presented publicly, but uh, again, those were uh, previous uh, and, and smaller. And then for someone who's newly diagnosed, what is suggestion? Is it to, to go into a trial, this trial or a different trial, or to try um, CNM AU8? So, so currently CNM AU8 is only available as part of the expanded access. And that's really for people who are not eligible for trials. So I think there's really a difference in sort of um, scope and, 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 and goals of clinical trials compared to expanded access. So again, um, if, if somebody is eligible for trials, then they would not be eligible for expanded access and vice versa. In the trial, I will say in, in the trial, if somebody participates in regimens, um, FOG or any other regimen really, all FDA approved um, standard of care medications for sporadic ALS are allowed. There's two kind of C9 related questions uh, and maybe we'll end on those. One is whether taking tofersin, which is a gene therapy for SOD1, would that be harmful for people with C9? And then related to that, are do we know of any gene therapy trial or updates for uh, people with uh, the genetic form of ALS caused by C9 or 72 mutations? Well, actually, I'm glad you asked because, you know, we've been really meeting with, with groups doing research on this uh, recently. And, and yes, there is a lot of research on uh, C9. As you know, uh, and specifically, there's a few companies in the space. Uh, unfortunately, there were a couple of trials that had negative results for C9 specifically. And so uh, those programs ended. That was, I believe, last year in 2022 that we had those results. And so uh, those ended. But there's many other companies actually working on C9. So I'm hoping to see maybe some phase new phase one studies for C9 um, over the next few months. Yeah. And I think there was another would Torfersen make sense for that? No, because it's really targeted to a, a very different um, genetic uh, change. And so, in fact, that's the beauty of, of the targeted uh, mechanisms, that there are targeted drugs that are specific uh, and, and hopefully more powerful for, the, for people with that particular uh, gene uh, mutation, but they wouldn't be, the, the flip side is that they're not applicable for anyone else. Thank you. And I know we're a little over time, but I just want to ask you the last question just so that we can, um, because we might not have been really uh, clear on this. Um, so if someone's, let's say, screening for the platform trial and they fit that subset you just we described that that um, where we're able to see some benefit regimen D or pro, uh, prodopidine, would they also be considered for new enrollment if that trial opens up in the future? Yeah, that's that's a good point. So I, I understand the question. So basically, uh, you know, uh, in a way, the question is also, you know, can you start with one trial and then uh, move to another one? Absolutely. I mean, people can start one trial and move to another trial. Our recommendation is, you know, if you start a trial, if at all possible, it's good to complete it and then move on to another one. Uh, and, and while, you know, I'm very excited that, you know, there, hopefully there will be a trial for a regimen, the regimen this drug in the future, I don't think it's happening right now. So I think there's still time, I guess, to participate in the platform trial and then move on to another trial later. Thank you. 
So I'm sorry we couldn't get to all the questions, but um, please, um, I hope people will come back uh, next week. Uh, we can carry forward some of the questions. And, um, yes, we will. Yeah. yeah. It's right. great to see so many questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Happy New Year, everybody. Thank you. Next Bye. week.